Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi, Annie. Like your mug. <laughs> Thank you. I miss you, Samadhi. I think I'd like to be with a vet walking down her cherry blossom lane. Quite an image. Yeah, I could do that. I could do the um, Michelle's waterfall also. <laughs> I think I'll follow Gary's lead and have a glass of red. No, that's water. I'm hydrating. Sorry. <laughs> don't get the wrong. This is not the Carson show where you don't know what they're in, what's in the coffee cups. <laughs> and the interesting your name, Y-O-S-O-C-K-Y, the best man in my wedding from I met in kindergarten. We go fishing every year was Y-S-O-N-G. Huh. Yeah, it's... it's well, beat Smith and Jones, I guess, huh? All right, everybody. It's um, 6 p.m. And uh, I'd like to call to order the second meeting of the General Plan Community Advisory Committee. My name is Andy Gustafson. I work with the city of Santa Rosa. I'm project manager for this project. And today we have a number of other staff members, team members in, in participation. I would like to... Um, say thank you to all of you who are joining us on the CAC and also to the public. Uh, it's very important as we move through this process that we are, um, have these open meetings and discussions as a way to be able to build a general plan that represents the input from all of the community members. Tonight we have a agenda that we're gonna go through and it's really one item on the agenda and we will be taking public comment as we move through each of the sub items so those of you who are um, listening or watching here tonight, um, please realize as the CAC members go through the discussion, you too will have opportunity to comment. Before we um, go further, I do want to um, have our hearing secretary take roll call of the CAC members. And if we do that now, please. Yes, so I am going to say your name. If you could please unmute yourself and just say here. Um, Aaron Schreiber Stainthrop. Ali Soto. Andreas Vigil. Actually, I received an email from Andreas. He is running a few minutes behind, but does plan to attend. Um, Annette Arnold. Here. Delache Carmona Benson. Erica Meekish. Oh, one moment. Michelle, I see that Delache does appear to be in the meeting, but maybe I, was on mute. Okay. Not present. Perfect. And then I believe I just promoted Erica Mikesh. Yeah, present. Erica Mikesh. Mikesh. Perfect. Um, Yvette Miner. Here. Um, Jen Close. Here. Lee Pierce. 
Here. Lisa Jocelyn. Here. Melanie Ehlers. Here. Michael Cook. Here. Omar Lopez. Here. Patricia Thompson. Here. Um, Rituja Bomik. Here. Thank you. Ryan Tracy. Here. Stephanie Maneri. Here. Steven Spillman. Here. Hugh Helm. Okay. Gary Wasaki. Here. Anna Stevens. Ann Barber. Here. Okay. Let the record reflect that all committee members are present except for Aaron Schreiber Stainthrope, Ali Soto, Hugh Helm, Anna Stevens, and we also have three vacancies remaining. Thank you very much. Um, Just really quick, uh, Ali Soto is here. Oh, perfect. That's right. I'm sorry, Allie. I was in the middle of roll call when I promoted you and forgot to come back to you. Oh, no worries. I was having um, some wavelength difficulty. So sometimes it's best if I turn off the camera, but I am here. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, guys. And uh, so this is a public meeting. And uh, as you'll hear later, it is subject to the Brown Act. And one of the things we do is allow for public comments on matters that are not on the agenda, but related to what the Community Advisory Committee um, is working on. So if you have a question or a, a statement you wish to make on a matter not on the agenda, please uh, raise your hand or press star nine if you're on the telephone and you'll be recognized and you'll have three minutes to make a comment. Okay, nice. it looks like we do have some public comment. Let me get the timer ready for you, Andy. Thank you. And, and I would add, okay. Go ahead. Okay, we have um, our first member um, is um, phone number ending in 5549. Please unmute yourself. Hello. Can Hi there. Yes, we can. Can you see the timer on my screen? I'm on a phone. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll just talk and we'll go okay. with that. So okay. uh, my name is Dwayne. I'm from uh, a place that's the most disadvantaged and underserved, yet unfortunately overburdened community in all of Santa Rosa. It's called Rosalind. <clears throat> a lot of folks in the city don't know about it, but I think it would be very helpful if all of the folks who are hoping to predict the future and project ideas into the future would come over and go through Roseland and see what it's like, especially how it's become worse in the areas that have been recently annexed by the city. General plans are typically aspirational documents and they actually don't have any um, legal status that can be held to account to hold anything in which you're talking about. So I understand it's, it's a nice exercise to look to the future and make some ideas of what might occur. I'm hoping that as you folks go forward, that you'll take the time 
to better publicize what you're doing and make it available to folks who are not online. There are a number of people who don't necessarily have 24 seven access to computers. Some of us can get to computers, but typically it might not be at the time in which the government is holding a meeting. So essentially what's been happening for at least a year now is virtual exclusion due to these types of meetings that you're holding. It's a form of being zoomed out actually for a number of people. And the local government could make the effort to print up things and get things into old fashioned type approaches like newspapers that older residents of the community would then be able to understand what you're up to. It would be an excellent opportunity during the things that are moving forward. I attended some meetings in the past and the example of the downtown specific plan, it also became exclusionary and kept out a lot of Roseland residents, even though a good portion of its activities involved a section of Roseland along Sebastopol Road at Dutton Avenue, moving to the east over to what's known as the Olive Park neighborhood, which used to be in Roseland before freeways divided us out, man-made breaks. And actually, a lot of our disadvantages and our overburdens are due to man-made decisions. So please help us rather than hurt us in your aspirations for the future and what you're going to predict. Thank you kindly for your time. Bye now. Okay, and that was three minutes. Oops. Okay. Do we have any other members of the public who wish to comment at this point? Um, if so, please raise your hand or press star nine and you'll be recognized. Okay, it looks like we do have one other um, member, Steve Bertel Bow. You should have a prompt and be able to um, unmute yourself. Thank Were you. you uh, Thank you, members of the advisory committee. Um, I'm Steve Bertelbaum I'm with the Transportation and Land Use Coalition. And uh, uh, we pay close attention to the relationship between our streets and, uh, uh, and the community that the streets serve. Um, the, uh, the issue I wanna talk about a bit tonight is uh, the matter of reducing vehicle miles traveled. Um, the state is uh, looking at a need to reduce vehicle miles traveled by about a third. Um, and there are two things that I think we ought to be aware of as we think about that. Uh, the first is that most trips that people make by car are less than five miles. Uh, many are less than three miles. Uh, they could be made by bicycle, especially with electric bicycles. Uh, many of them can be made on foot. Uh, the community needs to be amenable and inviting for people who want to ride their bikes or walk. Uh, sidewalks need to be in good repair. Uh, sidewalks need to be wide and shady. Uh, bicycle lanes need to be protected from traffic. Uh, and then people need to have food within easy walking distance. And it would be nice if every neighborhood had a corner store uh, every three blocks. And then the single family zoning that we have has tended to exclude duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes that could easily fit within neighborhoods and make it easier to run bus routes that served a lot of people. So I think it's those kind of changes that we need to think about as we think about reducing the amount of driving by about a third over the next nine years. Thank you for this opportunity to comment. I hope that you'll keep these ideas in mind. 
Thank you, Mr. Bertelbau. Um, do we have any other member of the public who wishes to comment at this point on a matter that's not on the agenda? I'm looking at our attendee list here. <clears throat> I'm not seeing any other hands. All right. So um, seeing none, we'll move on to uh, the first or the next item on the agenda, which is project team uh, updates and reports. Um, there are a number of items we want to quickly run you through for um, updates. And I will now uh, turn it over to the project team. Um, and I think I'll introduce Dan Amstead with MIG. And Dan, why don't you lead us through this? And I think I have the first item to report on. <laughs> we'll, we'll tag team a little bit, Andy. That sounds good. Well, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see uh, virtually all of our CAC members again here this evening. So this is great. We're excited to jump into the second CAC meeting here. And as Andy mentioned, we, we changed up the agenda a little bit. We're going to do uh, project team updates, we're calling as sort of the starting point. One is a little bit of an update on where we are on the project, but also there's a series of questions and comments the advisory committee uh, asked us the last meeting that we have some updated information on as well. So it's a little bit of a, a feedback and update before we get into the discussion uh, portion of the evening. So let me share my screen here. And if everyone can see that, I think we are good to, to jump in. So we're on the, the, the second piece of this, uh, which is the report backs. So big picture, just an update on where we are in this process is our, our last meeting here, uh, well, early February. We are jumping into what we're calling the community engagement event set number one, essentially. Um, and this meeting tonight is kind of a starting point to that, but we're going to be working with city staff, all of you Latino service providers and many others to launch uh, many different workshops, focus groups, events, uh, we're gonna have a workshop toolkit, I'll explain a little bit to hand out to everyone, but we're really starting this uh, first visioning piece of the project. So a nice milestone to kind of kick off this meeting as well. And as a reminder to the CAC members, but also the members of the community who are watching uh, this session as well, this is the overall project schedule for general plan update. It's uh, about a three year process and we're gonna get involved in a lot of different aspects of of policy and alternatives and analysis as we build this uh, overarching public policy document for the city of this general plan. Um, and also a reminder for the community members who are viewing tonight, all this material is available on the project website as well. So the first thing we wanted to wrap back around, we asked some questions about the Brown Act, but also just kind of the requirements of CAC members. So we wanna provide an update on that. And this is where I will hand it back to Andy for a quick update on the Brown Act. Okay, thank you, Dan. So um, when we send out the save the date notice to the CAC members back February 23rd, in that email, we had a little attachment, and I'm not sure you're gonna actually see this, but it was, we called it the one pager, which was actually a one and a half pager summary of the Brown Act. The reason we sent that out there was just for you to all to have a general understanding of the purpose of, of well, the Brown Act, intent that they, these are open public meetings and that they are conducted in a very specific, deliberate way to help to ensure that as you work through issues that um, you do so in a way with information that everybody has available and can uh, evaluate and discuss. This first slide here you see are things that we need to do to make sure these meetings are structured so that the public can participate to understand, to observe what we're talking about and to, to comment. And these are things that when you see our agendas be issued in advance of the meetings, we're striving to meet the deadline so that there's adequate notification time and that we've provided place in our agenda for the public to comment. And there was a question on our chat channel earlier, would the public have opportunity to comment tonight? And they will, you will, those of you in attendance, um, and, and then um, 
and that the packet that we're sending out is available for everyone that uh, provides a baseline information for us all to um, sh share together and, and form the basis of our discussion and deliberation. Next slide. So as CAC members, you do have a duty to come to the meetings prepared and, and come with uh, your own opinions and, and such. And, and there are a series of, of, sort of, of rules of conduct that revolve around potential communication between individual CAC members and outside, essentially outside of these meetings, you really cannot come together to discuss matters that are, will be uh, subject for discussion at an upcoming meeting, um, either by email or uh, in a variety of ways. And here are listed a number of sort of different types of meetings that have become to known under the Brown Act that are not permissible as you're coming uh, to a meeting uh, or, or in advance of a meeting, that really you should come to the meeting with your own ideas um, so that when you express them, it's, it's not um, based on an opinion or, or uh, uh, formulated ideas through conferring with other members of the CAC. Um, the biggest takeaway that I want you to have this evening is if you have a question, please call us and we can advise you. Many of you are already out there in the community speaking to people and we applaud that and we encourage it. Uh, this Brown Act doesn't prevent you from doing that. It's just be cautious about talking amongst yourselves as CAC members on CAC topics. Um, I, I think that covers it. Uh, and and uh, again, please uh, reach out to the project team if you have questions. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So a few other updates. Um, that we wanted just to present to the to the committee as well. And again, this is in the, the agenda packet or the homework packet that we sent out also. We do have the project website up and running. Um, it went live last December, as we mentioned the, the last meeting, but we are continuously updating it with a lot of project information, documents, all the uh, agenda materials for CAC meetings, for instance. It also includes a comment form for the community to provide comments as well. The web address is santarosaforward.com. It's in the lower right of the, the screen here on the presentation as well. So we've started to get a lot of activity from the community um, and, and some input as well through the website, which has been fantastic. We also launched last February, uh, what we're calling community survey number one. And this was really kind of uh, several different uh, purposes for this survey. One, we wanted to have an opportunity to do a lot of press releases, newspaper uh, releases, as well as uh, radio and other media to get the word out about the project and um, be, bring people to the new website and the survey. The questions in the survey, and, and hopefully most CAC members have actually taken the survey, uh, include ways that the community would like to be engaged as we go through this process and focuses on what we're calling sort of the, the mapping your neighborhood and how you define it and what some of the key features are of your neighborhood. And so to date, this is still an active survey. We're gonna have it up open for a while um, and actually turn this into a hard copy as well that I'll talk about a little bit later. But this is a quick snapshot of all of the participants so far. We've had nearly 1200 participants, around 800 people have done the mapping survey. So not everyone has defining for themselves what's the heart of their neighborhood and why it's the heart of the neighborhood, but also boundaries for their neighborhood as well. And it's a little bit of a, a spaghetti thing here, but the takeaway is we're getting a, a tremendous wealth of insights from the community and information about what makes uh, their neighborhood special, what some of the issues are or concerns. Because we talked about at the first CAC meeting we're really taking a, a bit of a unique approach on this general plan update project. We really wanna start with the neighborhoods as the core sort of foundational piece. And this exercise is quantitative, but also highly qualitative. And the feel, the characteristics, what makes it special? Is it the parks, the schools, the access to areas? Um, 
So we're getting a lot of information out of this. We're gonna start pulling together uh, some summary details as well before we move into the first community workshop. So we kind of see where all of this community input and ideas is leading. We've also prepared as a team, uh, the briefing book, which hopefully all of you had a chance to review. I'll go through a few slides and talk through some of the, the key takeaways. This comes from the very detailed existing conditions analysis, which was the first big uh, work product or uh, effort as part of this general plan update. The briefing book is again, also available on the website for the public in both English and Spanish versions. Um, and it's organized around these, these big sort of topical areas. Um, again, it's summarizing the existing conditions report. So a lot of it is data or quantitative, a good starting point, but as we'll discuss tonight, there's also the qualitative side of it and the, the community uh, concerns and ideas. Um, one quick pause here, I just got reminded by staff, I'm going to ask Ana Padilla, who's also on our team, to do a, a quick overview, uh, welcome in Spanish, just to see if we have any Spanish language participants here from the community. I apologize, we should have done that earlier in this process, but I'm going to ask Anna to jump on here real quick, if she can. Thank you, Dan. Uh, hola, buenas tardes. Uh, uh, bienvenidas a esta junta reunión de la, esta, de la del CAC. Um, si hay alguna persona que necesita traducción, uh, por favor levantan la mano. Uh, hay un icono abajo de la pantalla para levantar la mano si hay, hay alguien que necesita traducción. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you, Ana. Um, and if there are Spanish language participants, Ana is here to, to help translate these materials as well. So, Another key component of the, the CAC packet, but this really came from our last discussion, some of the questions that all of you have asked, is what is the CAC's role in this first community engagement event set or getting information out um, and reaching out to the community? So we put together this checklist. Um, you know, By no means, we don't wanna overburden the committee members. We know you're all busy. But if there's opportunities to get the word out to your organizations, the groups you're involved in, uh, especially around the website and the survey, just to get more exposure in addition to uh, newspaper articles and, and radio spots um, and digital email blasts we've already done, that would be fantastic. Again, we're really just starting the discussion on the general plan. So as much as we can get exposure and uh, awareness of this project is really key right now. We will be holding a committee, uh, the first community workshop or sort of a event on this project. Um, we're working on nailing down the date, but it'll be mid April, mid to late April. Uh, we'll let every CAC member of course know the date and, and heavily publicize it to the community as well. Um, but once we get the save the date ready and uh, able to send out, we'll send an email to all CAC members to, again, help us push that information, get a lot of people at this first community, uh, community meeting. But in addition to the first community meeting, um, which will be a Zoom virtual session, kind of like this, <clears throat> we're also planning to do, working with city staff, a series of focus groups or smaller group meetings, and these can be topically topical based or with different community groups. We're also going to translate all the materials from the first workshop into what we're calling an engagement toolkit. And um, these have been very successful on other general plan projects just to get a, a greater reach and uh, more engagement from the community. This will be a combination of digital and physical materials, but essentially it will be a, a, a portable workshop similar to this first community workshop It'll have the presentation materials in the background, but also survey forms. Um, so for city staff, for other partners or CAC members, if you wanna have additional meetings during this first community event set with uh, your HOA or with other community organizations you're involved in, this toolkit will let you easily do that. Um, and then we get just more comments and information back from the community as well. So we're working on all of these products right now, and uh, we'll provide all of them to the, to the CAC. 
at the end of this engagement process, and again, a lot of different events, but kind of the same discussion at each of the events, we will also be meeting with uh, planning commission and city council, um, not for any decisions or actions, it's really just an update to them. So each time we go through one of these big community event sets, we wanna wrap back around with the planning commission and city council. What did we hear? What was the community's ideas or concerns? Um, so we have these regular check-ins with them as well. And this gets us to another question I was raised last time of a little more definition around CAC member roles um, in addition to these meetings. And just as kind of a, a reminder, but also thinking about as we're jumping into this first engagement event set, you're really liaisons to the community and the different groups that you represent. The city's done a fantastic job forming this committee uh, with a great geographical distribution and different ideas and ages and genders and races. And we really want uh, you to leverage all of your different constituent groups and connections to get the word out on the project, um, but also through these engagement materials like the toolkit, help us get more information back in from the community as well. Um, and to that end, participation in all these events, you know, is really key. Working with the project team, which is city staff and consultants, uh, you know, there's things we can do to help as well. Let us know and, and we can work with staff to, to figure out those uh, resources as well. But it's also providing ideas uh, into this process as well. All of you are members of the community. And as we'll talk through in a, in a few minutes here, when we get to the interactive discussion. We're going to have a, sort of a starting point of this community workshop exercise tonight with all of you uh, to get your ideas and to get a starting point as we start framing a little bit of an initial vision here that we'll take to the community. So with that, um, maybe just a quick pause. There's a lot of updates there, but any questions from CAC members on any of the updates before we jump into the, the main exercise for this evening? Uh, yes, Steve, you have your hand raised. Yes, I was wondering if uh, members of the CAC will be invited to uh, participate or at least observe the workshops and focus groups so that we could get our firsthand impressions. Absolutely, the workshop uh, everyone's invited to, we can work on logistics with city staff. We may need to open it technically as a CAC meeting because we have a quorum of all of you. Um, the focus groups may be a bit more of a challenge just with the Brown Act and having multiple CAC members. But one of the advantages of this digital world is all of these sessions will be recorded, um, whether it's the big workshop or focus groups as well. So I think we, it's a good question. I think we'll, we'll wrap back around with staff around the Brown Act of just how many CAC members are in one event um, and let folks know. But I would say for the community workshop, more participation is always better. So that would be definitely one where we want everyone to be involved. It, somewhat uh, connected to that, one of the public comments uh, was regarding the uh, specific areas and neighborhoods of the city. And I was wondering if there is, if we would have access to um, visiting those areas. Now, I'm a little bit of a disadvantage because I'm somewhat of a newcomer, but I have found that even if folks who live in the area for 10 or 20 years, maybe don't really have a strong connection to various neighborhoods or have insights into the issues. And I was wondering, do we, do we have an opportunity to visit those neighborhoods as a group or uh, should we do that on our own or should we coordinate this in some manner with the city and the community activists in the area? That's a great question. Um, we, we do have COVID pandemic protocols from just some in-person stuff. That's hopefully will go away in the next several months um, and we can start having bigger events as groups. Um, I, I love the idea. I think uh, we need to work with staff to kind of think through the logistics of that, but we have quite a few CAC meetings here as we go through the next uh, couple of years. So that's a, it's a really interesting idea. Um, and uh, Gary, I see you have your hand up as well. I do, and I, I do appreciate Steve's uh, enthusiasm 
to uh, participate more. So on the Brown Act discussion and uh, having endured that for eight years as Lee has, isn't because, don't we need a majority? And this is a rather large committee. I appreciate the advice given. I, I strongly doubt that would be an issue should a majority of this committee show up to a community event or a focus group event, A, and B is an advisory group, because we're not taking any votes. I wonder if it even applies, and I'm sorry to throw a monkey wrench in, but I just, I want to, when Steve says he wants to go, I want to, I want to give him a yes. Mm -hmm. I do as well. I just want to double check with staff. <laughs> so I think, well. I think we're moving towards a yes. Um, you know, for instance, we have in our project uh, a double decker bus tour of this, of the city with the CAC. And that's something we, we still have in the project at some point, um, but we've had to push off because of the pandemic. So I think there's creative ways, uh, many creative ways we can do this. And also with the, you know, the focus groups as well. Mm -hmm. um, just to kind of pace each nice discussion, you know, comment noted, uh, we're going to wrap back around our staff and think through some ways to make this work, but it's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ryan, questions on the, the report backs? Yeah, I had a question about um, sharing ideas. So, so obviously we're, we're a really large group and, and meeting time, you know, is only so limited. So I was, I was curious, are, are meetings the only forum for sharing ideas and questions with the project team or is some of that can that be done offline or what's the mechanism for that? Can I jump in here um, and respond to that question? <laughs> so as CAC members, you are invited to um, communicate with us, the project team, anytime, all the time. Uh, this has come up. Some of you have been out and, and um, working to make uh, your constituent groups or, or your circle of influence aware of the general plan update. You've helped us with getting the press release out. And in doing so, you, you receive comments. So how uh, the question has been, how do we receive those comments? Should you carry those back or, or, or is there another method to do so? And you can always encourage people to reply by SR um, forward at srcity or that's the email um, and people can write to us directly. You can call us, me. Um, my number is published on all the uh, uh, project email and you could, and, and that's gonna be continuous throughout the, pro the project. We realize we get the benefit of your participation and insight in these meetings, but a huge value that you add is as liaisons, the contacts you meet and, and the, the questions and issues and comments you hear, you can bring those back to us. But the idea is definitely noted. I think there are some ways we can, we can make all this work. Um, Mike, you have your hand up as well. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up another way to potentially get out to the neighborhoods and that's uh, by council districts, since now we're all, all broken up by district. And actually having the council members lead lead and help and attend those uh, meetings. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting creative texts from our team as we talk of self guided tours and other methods as well. So I think this is this is getting a lot of ideas going. Um, and if there's additional ideas as well, like Andy said, please feel free to to shoot him an email. And um, you know, we definitely our goal on our side is to find ways to do this creatively throughout the project, especially during the pandemic um, as well. Michelle. I just wanted to point out um, a comment on the chat, which had to do with whether or not, and if so, how would community members contact members of the CAC to share ideas and was in particular looking for areas of shared interest. And I wanted to go, you know, have the check in about being contacted by members of the public, number one. And then number two, just to uh, remind people that there was this handy, oh, I don't know if you can see it here, uh, worksheet that was done as the notes from the first meeting, which um, was kind of a wheel of interest of all the CAC members and uh, what they shared publicly about their um, 
their passions and expertise and connections and so forth. And that might be a tool that the public could um, enjoy in terms of knowing how they might relate with different members. Yeah, that's a great point. And when we get to Yvette, I, I do want to mention, um, you know, as an open public process, we would like everyone to reach out through email or comment forms of the website to staff first, and then we can help kind of organize different topics or focus groups as well. Um, it, it just makes sure that we're collecting all the comments and questions, which is really key throughout this process. So we're hearing from everyone. So staff is playing a little bit of a logistical support role in that sense as well. So if there are ideas, thoughts uh, about all of this for members of the community watching, you know, please email us your comments and ideas. You can throw it in chat tonight. We're recording that as well. That'd be great. Um, but you have your hand up. And for those that um, don't have access to technology, um, is there, I know Andy did mention they can give them a call. So let's say they wanted to have a more in depth, like they wanted to do the survey, but they wanted to do it with a person is something like that available. And then also we have um, some people with disabilities. Uh, I've worked with people in the past that need a teletype machine. Is, mm -hmm. How would you incorporate that? Or do you need a resource for somebody that can do that portion for people with, that are hearing impaired? Great, great point. One of the very intentional reasons of doing the workshop toolkit is to get physical versions of the digital community workshop survey and materials developed. Um, so staff is going to help with some of that. Uh, we have a new the city has a new planner for uh, health and community and, and inclusive community engagement, Beatrice, who's on the line tonight. She's going to be helping us organize some of that as well. Um, we'll have uh, physical materials for CAC members. I think it, great idea about um, hearing or visual impaired or other folks who need special uh, help to be reached out to as well. I think we want to uh, coordinate closely with the city's community engagement team on that. because I think there's already some things in play, but it's a great idea uh, for us to have that on our radar as well. It's a really good point. Uh, Mike, additional additional question, comment. Uh, Dan, sorry, just just uh, to respond to Yvette's uh, comment. Hi, Yvette. My name is Beatriz. I am the um, Equity and Public Health Planner. So, if we want, if you want to discuss this further, we we have had uh, conversations not only about people with disabilities, but people who speak other languages that are not being covered by the communications that we have right now through the CD staff. And so we can talk further about this if you're interested and I'm, I'm happy to contact you to talk more about uh, this topic because I think it's a really, really relevant topic and we have been um, discussing it. So uh, sorry for the interruption, Dan, and sorry. That was perfect. And introducing Beatrice here as a great new team member and fantastic resource in the city as well. Uh, to nice us. to meet you. Thank you then. All right, so I, I just uh, had a question. So if all the public, uh, ideas and comments are going to SR4 to srcity.org. Uh, does this committee get uh, all those uh, comments, ideas? And then a comment, um, we should somehow figure out a way to include the youth. I'm on the elementary school board in East Santa Rosa and uh, it's their future. It's it's their, their city, hopefully, mm -hmm. if they can afford to live here. Absolutely, yes. These are all uh, components of the engagement process, and we do have youth-specific uh, activities working with uh, different school classes and also the different ages, you know, how you're engaging the different age groups, elementary, high school, college as well. Um, so part of this is going into a more detailed uh, sort of strategy for this near term. But I do want to mention this is also all included in the community involvement strategy which is the, the document we, we worked with the city to prepare last fall, which is on the website as well. Uh, but it has a lot of detail around youth engagements and other community engagement activities. So for members of the public here tonight as well, I do want to mention that the CIS or community involvement strategy is also on the website. Okay, let's, um, and that's a perfect segue to this diagram as well, because <laughs> I think it may explain some of the process. Um, we are again in this community event set number one, which is thinking about visioning or really this, this big initial discussion about the future of Santa Rosa. Um, we'll eventually go into focus discussions on opportunities and alternatives and draft policies. 
but this is really the, the, the first big engagement event set of this project. Um, this diagram here is kind of showing the, the general stage of working through community ideas um, for each one of the phases of the project. The, the TAC is the Technical Advisory Committee, which is really uh, city staff on a very broad level. We actually are around 50 members on that. The tax role is really um, confirming data is accurate. We have all the up-to-date information, things they're hearing as well. Then, and this is not a, a, a rigid structure by any means, but then is going to the CAC and having a discussion we're gonna have tonight but both the TAC and the CAC discussion help set up this first round of community uh, workshop materials, essentially. And like I mentioned, we're gonna have a lot of different events over a couple months to get a lot of community ideas, input and feedback. We'll then report back to the planning commission and council what we're hearing, but then the next CAC meeting, we're also reporting back to all of you as well. So one of the, the challenges and the fun challenge on, on our side is taking all of these ideas and um, one, making sure we're gathering and just logistically capturing all the ideas, but also the major takeaways, points of consensus uh, that we're hearing from the community. So to Mike's question, this does come back to the CAC in the next round. You know, this is what we heard from two months of engagement, for instance. And we'll be doing this as we move through this process to make sure the CAC is well informed what we're hearing, but also planning commission, city council as well. And so to start tonight's discussion, and um, we're gonna do a, a little bit of a round robin here and, and take notes and kind of talk through this. But again, this is, this is high level. This is the first time thinking about this. We had a homework assignment uh, for each CAC member to review the briefing book. And this is, uh, again, kind of an executive summary of facts and findings from the existing conditions report and the initial analysis done by the consultant team. Um, it's organized, again, around land use and community character, social and environmental justice, fire-related hazards, housing, economic development, uh, mobility and travel patterns, parks and public services. Um, these are pretty broad baskets of topics, but we wanted to create this summary of really what are the key takeaways or things from the, the more research side of this project and the existing conditions analysis. So with land use and community character, um, the, the, the key sort of takeaways is Santa Rosa is a relatively built out community with very well established neighborhoods, as I think all of us know. You know, there's a lot of low density single family homes. Uh, that is the largest land use and covers around 52% of the city limits as well. So we're suburban community, but you know, there's, there's key commercial corridors and downtown is uh, more intense kind of a place. Social and environmental justice, definitely uh, front and center with the community discussions and input we've heard so far, and probably on everyone's mind here as well. And really that, that falls into several key categories, but one is environmental justice, which is a big component of any general plan and a required component of any general plan. But thinking about health and equity impacts and how they affect all members of our, of our community. Um, and so some, Key takeaways from this analysis and looking at the data side again of it is parts of the Northwest and Southwest and downtown, you know, Roseland, as, as was mentioned earlier uh, by one of the public comments, are facing environmental justice issues. And what do we mean by that in a general plan public policy framework? Well, that's proximity of unhealthy land uses, limited infrastructure like sidewalks, uh, parks, other amenities, limited access to fresh and healthy food, historically lower influence in uh, the decision-making process and political process, and also locations of uh, recognized disadvantaged communities based on, on state recognition of it, but also just the distribution of where they are and those communities and lower life expectancy, expectancy in these areas, which makes citywide average lower than county and state averages. I have, and, a, I have a question. Yes. Um, it was in regards to the unhealthy um, 
land issues. Um, there are certain areas of Santa Rosa that is, you know, boxed in by the freeways. And so there's a healthy uh, California healthy index, I believe, that shows those numbers. And is that's something that should be, I think it should be put into the book as well as we're moving forward, because what we do with the land use in those areas will continue to either make the situation worse. So as we're moving forward as a city, we need to be able to look at that healthy index and say, okay, maybe we shouldn't put too many housing in this area because it's already impacted because of the environmental issue. So I didn't really see, I just saw a statement. I didn't really see information in regards to the numbers in relation to that. So is that something that can be put into the book or how could we tackle that? Uh, great, great point. Um, well, we can tackle it by adding it to the book. I think that's, a, that's a, a, a clear way to address it. We do have the detailed existing conditions report itself that has a, a, a ton of additional data and metrics. So this book is just kind of the high level summary, but to your point, how we're doing that high level summary, you know, we can, we can refine and adjust that as well. Um, it would be good to also take a look though at the, the full existing conditions report because I think there's a lot of information there that would be additionally helpful as part of this discussion and just understanding the metrics uh, and information that we have availability to. Uh, yes, Steve, you have your hand raised. Yes, uh, those of us who are not familiar with these statistics that are in front of us should be jolted. I mean, we should all keep this in mind and focus on this over the next year. Absolutely, and that's why this is first and foremost, the first step of this project is let's understand this data, get familiar with it, but the land use and other policy decisions and changes that are part of this plan, you know, build, build from this, like Steve said, um, and Yvette as well. So another topic that is uh, front and center is fire and other related hazards. Um, obviously, this has massively impacted the city over the last several years. And um, without changes, can continue to massively impact the city as we go through climate change. So <laughs> through the analysis and mapping, again, the detail of this, this very large existing conditions report, there are probably unsurprisingly areas throughout Santa Rosa that are vulnerable to intense and uncontrollable wildfires and climate change is increasing that risk. Um, there's a likelihood of 72% probability that Santa Rosa will experience a damaging earthquake in the next 30 years. And that's predictable data, uh, so to speak. But when we think about hazards, you know, it, it, it's always good to keep in mind it's more than just fires. Those have been front and center, no doubt, but floods, earthquakes, other natural disasters um, are all factors and probabilities in the future as well that we need to, to think about and address. Another big basket, housing, employment, and economic development. Um, so some of the, again, very high level takeaways, but important ones, seniors and other households without children account for uh, the most recent household growth in Santa Rosa. So a large senior, uh, just proportionally growth in the city, which is an interesting takeaway. Um, the median household income and higher educational attainment levels have increased since 2010, but are lower still than countywide. So there are some changes uh, around increasing income and educational attainment, but it's still not uh, the same on a countywide level as well. So travel and commute patterns, how we get around the city, um, it's always, not always, because this is what this is the first one, but it's interesting doing a general plan project during a pandemic because traffic obviously is dramatically down because we're all staying home. But based on recent data up until lockdown and stay at home orders, 37% of employed residents work in the city, which is pretty good, uh, but allows the ability to reduce potential vehicle miles traveled because um, 89% of them drive to work, even though it's drives within the city of Santa Rosa. So improved transit and other modes of mobility can really help um, reduce traffic, reduce congestion, reduce pollution. Uh, smart commuter rail and city investment in transit, bike and pedestrian facilities have encouraged 
uh, less single occupancy driving, and there's some data around that as well. So that's encouraging, you know, the investments in multimodal and transit uh, is improving some of the, the traffic and congestion concerns. And our last category here is around parks and, and public services as well. And you can see this is a, a detailed map inventory with buffers of walking distances to parks and open space. Um, again, for folks on the CAC or in the community who want more detail and more data behind this, the existing conditions report, which is posted on the website, has uh, pages and pages on each of these topics. This is just the high level summary. Um, but the general plan, what's, what's really important to think about in this process, can support staffing levels and resources needed to deliver these high quality city services. So as the overarching public policy document for the city, the amount of parkland uh, per capita or different staffing ratios can be included and often are as part of general plan policy as well. So this talks a lot about the issues and challenges, but there are also opportunities for thinking about how we address this differently going forward. I have a question. Yes, you did. Uh, in relation to, um, I can't remember exactly who made the comment about us utilizing our, our bikes and things of that nature. Um, one of the problems that we hear a lot about is about safety. And mm -hmm. so being able to ride on the bike paths and utilize what we have available to us is just unsafe in, in some areas. And so is that something that will be addressed in the book? Um, I think it's important that if we're gonna try to promote utilizing other forms of transportation, safety needs to be addressed as well. Absolutely, and that is, you, you read my mind, that's a great transition to our discussion because the book is the existing data. Now it goes to what do we do relative to the existing data. So it's kind of a primer for tonight's discussion, um, which I do want us to jump into here because we're getting up almost to seven o'clock. But, but, but first, Gary, you had your hand up. So I want to take your question before we jump into the discussion. Well, it, it's more of a statement. And I'm, I'm glad Yvette said what she, was, what she just said because I couldn't agree more. People won't ride, we won't change our habits, we won't walk unless we create safe spaces. And the general plan in my mind is aspirational as Mr. DeWitt said earlier. And to me, my aspiration to join this process is to create safe spaces in our town, in our neighborhoods. So we have safe spaces to walk and to ride bicycles and therefore reduce vehicle miles traveled and therefore reduce the nasty negative spiral of higher global emissions and, and global warming. So I would love us to focus on that. It is aspirational, but we can drill down and make it easier for increased density so people can have less distances to go. Uh, it, so it, it's not a question, it's a statement, and I don't mean to be a grandstander on that, but that's why I said yes to signing up here. Because I would love th this town's made for that with all the with all the creeks and with uh, the volunteerism and the people wanting and the climate and the people wanting to be outside. I just would love to see it happen. Absolutely, and, and Gary, you just volunteered to go first because <laughs> you just went first. That is exactly the question we want to ask right now. So uh, I'm going to introduce Michelle Gervais, and Steve will get to you in well as a second here. But the question and discussion right now, we want to go through. Um, and I'm gonna call on folks based on how my Brady Bunch tiles are sort of framed here. Um, but we wanna go through just like Gary did. Okay, we have data, we have information. We also, all of you have extensive background understanding on Santa Rosa. And in a year and a half, when we have the draft general plan, we'll have specifics. But here is a starting point. What is, what are these aspirational thoughts around the vision? And really the goal tonight is we wanna frame some vision elements and some vision ideas. And um, so we're gonna go around, spend about two minutes with each, each person here on the CAC, uh, cause we have about an hour here. And I like folks to describe two or three key things that frame a vision for the future. So, so Gary, you just did that. You just framed one of them of, of having mobility and safety around mobility and transportation. I'll call you in again. Is there another key piece of a vision element 
that you want us to be thinking about as well. Um, tonight's a brainstorming discussion. You know, we just want to sort of coalesce and, and capture these ideas. Uh, but that is exactly the kind of, of detail of, we've seen this data, now what do we do with it? What's kind of big picture? Um, so Gary, I'll go back to you before we jump to others. Anything in addition to mobility that would frame your big vision for where the future of Santa Rosa is 15, 20 years from now? Can I ponder that and, and sum it up later? Because I didn't know I was the lead off guy. <laughs> I didn't warn you first. <laughs> All right. I, I will. Yeah, we can come back. Okay, thank you. Um, but with that in mind, and with a hand raise, I'll go to Steve next. Um, so, a couple thoughts on big picture vision, things we want to make sure are are captured at an aspirational level in the general plan as we start. Yes, the uh, the idea of safety is paramount, and that is one of our local governments and citizens alike need to focus on. One thing that uh, I've observed around the United States and around the world is that streets become safer when there's more people on the streets. When there's a few, just a couple of people on the streets, then it's maybe not so safe. But when you have hundreds of people on the streets walking around, safety is enhanced. Mm -hmm. and Therefore, well, how do you do that? Well, you do that with um, you know, creating land use policies that increase densities in some places, but you don't increase it all around. You have plenty of open space. So instead of having 10 blocks of three-story buildings, you have a couple of blocks of eight-story buildings with public parks, but you put, you're really activating the street. You're activating the sidewalks. And when, when there's a lot of people on the sidewalks, there's less opportunity or less incentive for people to um, commit crimes or uh, do things that are going to um, impact the safety of people. Right, so more activations, more activity, maybe some higher densities, but it's creating that more dynamic. Uh, the same thing along with, it's similarly to the, the, uh, the, the transportation systems. If there's, if someone is going to, if people are willing to walk two, three, four, five blocks to public transportation. They're not willing to walk a mile to public transportation. So if you increase the densities in some places and you allow people to walk two or three blocks of public transportation from their home, mm -hmm. get on the public transportation, they get off the public transportation and they walk two or three blocks, four blocks to their, to their work, they're willing to do that. They won't walk a mile or two to get on the bus or the train or the smart and then have to walk another mile to get to their job. So increasing some density and increasing the open spaces around these higher densities has been proven to be one so possible solution to increasing safety and increasing the access to and, and efficiency of public uh, transportation. That's good, thank, thank you, Steve. And we have Anna uh, recording comments and ideas here as well. Um, I see Della Shea has her hand up and she's also the next one on my screen here. So Della Shea, why don't you go next? We, we started with some mobility ideas around the vision. Um, uh, thoughts on, on, on key things to be thinking about it for our vision of Santa Rosa moving forward. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of um, SRJC. Um, I deal with a lot of the students there. And um, one of the main issues that we found with um, transportation was it being cut off so early. Our classes end around nine at night. And so there are students that work during the day and was trying to take night classes and were unable to take night classes because there wasn't any transportation at night for them. Mm -hmm. um, was one and two, the disability students that need the bus for wheelchair capacities to get to and from school 
also had that problem because the buses that go by SRJC cut off around 7.30. Well, that's kind of doesn't work for them if the class goes all the way to 9.30. Well, it ends at 9, 9.30, and then you got to give them time to get to the bus stop. So that was a real big issue and has been brought up in the past year. Uh, of course, not so much with COVID, but the year before last, that transportation was a huge issue as far as nighttime goes. Great. No, thank you. That, that, and the, the equity around access to transportation and how everyone's getting, getting served and benefited from that as well is very key. Um, and, and again, we should be thinking about more than just transit. I, I love mobility and transit, don't get me wrong. But uh, we're, we're brainstorming ideas here around the vision of the future and, and how we kind of want to set up some ideas as we go to the community. Um, next, I'll call on Jen Close. You were, you were right next Can to I you. weigh in real yeah. fast, Dan? Yes. Sorry, it's Michelle. Just a quick uh, housekeeping mechanism so that we aren't having breakfast together. I think um, maybe if everybody could keep just a a headliner. I think we'll start to hear some familiar notes. You can second that emotion. You can weigh in deeper with uh, comments as you wish, but I just want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I love that these early ones have um, kind of more to say. And then as we go through, people can tag team. Thank yeah. you. And, uh, and to that end, it's hard not to think specifically of solutions, but let's keep this very high level, you know, we want to be uh, a healthy community or a sustainable community or resilient because that's going to help us think through are we covering all the topics that are that are important as well as we start framing these these different vision ideas or vision components. Um, so with that and to keep us on time, I will talk less. So Jen, why don't you go next? Uh, additional ideas or things to add to this discussion. Okay, thanks. Um... All right, so I wrote a few things down here. And I'll try to go quickly. Um, so I'd like to see healthy and diverse neighborhoods, um, which really requires that we have a diversity of housing um, scattered throughout the, um, the city um, and uh, it, that is also affordable and diversity of housing at, at, at um, various income levels. Um, and I think healthy and diverse neighborhood gets to a lot. We will unpack that, but so you want to keep a high level. So I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. um, a really vibrant city center um, that sort of highlights and supports our local business and um, and our, our local artists um, is walkable. Something that is is engaging to the public. Um, I want to put a, a a plus one on uh, safe and practical um, options to automobile transportation. It's got to be practical. The bus that comes every hour is just not um, for lots of people. Um, and then. I don't, I don't, uh, I also, I like to see a city that really protects and showcases our natural environment, which is amazing and gives um, access, actual equitable access to our park system. Oh, okay, thanks for that time. It's the equitable access to parks as well. Great, thank you, Jen. Um, why don't we go to uh, Lee, your physical hand is up and you're next to me as well. Lee, why don't you go next? I think you're muted, Lee. Oh, you're still muted. I can't hear you. I think you need to unmute. Do you see it, Lee? Do you see an icon in the left hand of your screen that shows a microphone crossed out in red? If you click that once. Michelle, if you are the administrator, can you ask Lee to unmute and give that'll give him a pop up option? I did hit the ask to unmute. Um, there, there we go. There we Perfect. go. Now we can read Lee. Yeah, just give me a minute and I can get it. Um, I want to kind of pick up on uh, Jen Close's comments because she stole all of my things out of my head, basically. Um, you know, back when uh, I sat on the council and the planning commission and all, the things that we talked a lot about are still relevant today. And that was uh, transit oriented uh, development, uh, certainly protecting our uh, green uh, borders around the, the city in the process. But uh, another 
element since I've been uh, on the Black Chamber of Commerce uh, that, that I'd like to talk about because I serve on uh, some Bay Area groups of that chamber where it's called the Northern California Black Presidents uh, Chamber of, of Commerce. And a lot of our concerns are very similar. Apparently we lost like 440 uh, black businesses uh, with the pandemic and the whole thing. We know it hit us really hard here in Sonoma County for all small businesses. And that 11% on the graph you had earlier uh, that showed, uh, I, I think it was talking about uh, uh, the white population was like uh, the top 60 something. Or then you had 30, 35% Latino, Latinx. And 11% was like all the, the smaller uh, communities of color, including uh, African-Americans, Asian, Pacific Islanders, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to make sure that those groups, uh, when we t went through the uh, tourism uh, mechanism, mm -hmm. talks about uh, Santa Rosa in the North Bay, that uh, it's attractive to come here for those groups because we know numbers make a difference. And when we see those kind of small numbers and uh, it, it affects employment, it, ex it affects education, affects all of those important items. And I used to work in the private sector and the public sector. And I would hear all the time during recruitment, uh, they say, we're look looking for more minorities. And they'd be even specific about that. And, and, and those who, like Hewlett Packard, for example, uh, would say, uh, we went out on the campus and we found a few people, we brought them up, but they didn't want to live here. They, they just didn't think it was going to be a comfortable place. That's not my experience. And so I, we're going to try to do the best we can in groups like the chamber, Black chambers throughout Northern California and, and beyond. But I think as cities uh, and counties, we really need to understand that wages matter so people can move up in this, in this area. Housing really matters so they don't have, have to spend time commuting. Uh, these are not strange issues to any other, to white people or anybody else. These are issues that we all are concerned about. But when there's some systemic racism issues that we're dealing with, even in healthcare, I, I was shocked. I, I went to some healthcare discussions by some uh, African-American female doctors talking about why black people aren't getting into the COVID uh, vaccination situation early. I just got mine completed as a matter of fact uh, on the 29th, my second shot. But there's things that would bring more parity. And I think that's in your, your list of making sure that there's uh, opportunities for all not just the same old thing. These 11%, yeah, they're not enough to, to make a noise. So that's kind of my passion. No, that's fantastic. I thank you, Lee. And that's a very, very good point, opportunities for all. I do want to make sure everyone has a chance here to talk. And I see Steve, you have your, your hand raised and probably things to add. I'm going to pace through the room a little bit, but if anyone wants to add to chat additional comments as well, I just want to make sure everyone gets a chance to to provide some vision thoughts here as well. So I want to head to, I'm just going through this, uh, Lisa next, and then to Yvette, because we you had some comments, but we didn't get to your vision statements here. So Lisa next, and then we'll go to Yvette. Can I, this is Charlie from the general plan team. Can I just jump in for a second? So yep. what, what you guys are illustrating, which is super important, is the general plan touches every aspect of life in Santa Rosa. And what, what we really need from you, especially with this many people in a short time is, when you look out 20, 30 years, or even five or 10 years, or even next year in Santa Rosa, what are your priorities? What do you, 
what's your vision? What do you think are the things that we need to work on the most? Because the general plant can't, can't do everything, um, but it can do a lot. And as someone said at the beginning, you know, it's, it's not exactly where the law sits. You know, the law comes through zoning and other ordinances, but as you look out in the future, what's most important to you? So what I just heard Lee say was, it's not just about equity in, you know, how the city behaves, but it's creating equity and choices for people. And you guys have all said transportation, housing, and now we're hearing wages and jobs. So these are really important ideas, but, um, and I'm gonna stop talking so we can, so you guys can, but just think about how, how do you tell us what's, what are the most important things that you think we can do through the general plan update? And really the sky's the limit that the general plan deals with everything we, we do every day in, in, in our daily lives. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Lisa. Okay, first of all, I wanna say thank you. I'm appreciating the perspective of each one of you who's sharing. You are educating me and deepening my understanding about all aspects of it. Things that are important to me that I would like to see um, evolve and work on in the city are climate change and the fire prevention and protection. Just even last night when the winds picked up and the temperature was increasing at night, I had a nervous reaction to that. Like, thank goodness this is in August. Um, so I think that is a very important um, aspect. Secondly, um, land use planning issues around vineyards and the upcoming and growing cannabis industry. I've had some people share their thoughts with me about the ordinance that's going on in Sonoma County um, that's being developed and how those kinds of things and how it's um, voted on uh, could affect Santa Rosa. Um, I'm also interested in balancing housing needs with open space and uh, green belts and that um, any housing that is higher density housing that is done, um, that does infill or whatever, also take into consideration um, the existing neighborhoods so that there be transition areas and balance. Um, last, um, but definitely not least, homelessness. Um, I read this mm -hmm. next door in many other places. It is such a huge issue and with the pandemic and with um, fires, et cetera, we have so many more homeless and I don't have any solutions, but in terms of uh, visioning, I would like to see these people taken care of. Yeah, housing, housing for all. No, those are great additions as well. Thank you, Lisa. Let's go to Vet, and then I'll call on uh, Mike to go next. But, and this uh, is, but. I'm going to just interrupt, and I apologize. I just really want everybody to get a turn to talk. So I sent a post. Would is 90? If, if it would be helpful, I can be a timer, and I'll wave when it's 90 seconds, minute and a half, and then and and it's not a cut you off, but I'll just give you an indication. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you, you Michelle. Uh, Yvette. Yes. Uh, one of the things that's very important is that we need to know the Santa, um, the demographics of Santa Rosa as we're moving forward. So if somebody can get that information for us as we're moving forward. So my key thing that I would like to see in Santa Rosa is income-based housing, which is different than affordable. Um, pedestrian bridges to help with safety. As people are coming in to build in our city, we should be you know taxing them a little bit to have those pedestrian bridges. And then also um, how many of us have used public transportation? Question we should all ask to see how many of us have done that. And then also reimagining the green spaces like rooftop um, gardens is something that we might need to consider because we're very limited in Santa Rosa um, green space. That would be great. Great, great, great points. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mike and then Omar will follow Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Uh, so for me, uh, my passion is uh, housing and um, getting housing of all types uh, for our youth, for our uh, less uh, fortunate, for our most fortunate. Uh, I believe we need housing for all um, at every level. And when uh, I'm a landscape architect, when I work on projects for developers, um, going through our current general plan, um, 
it's a nightmare. Uh, and, and it's not a nightmare because it's a bad plan. It's a nightmare because there's so much interpretation that can be done on staff side, on the applicant side, and on the NIMBYism or neighborhood or attorney side. Uh, I would love to see more specific guidelines, more specific, uh, uh, like, like basically a more specific layout of what you can and can't do in each of the each of the areas in um, Santa Rosa. I'd also like to see more housing and higher um, uh, buildings in Santa Rosa so that they are more affordable. Um, and then moving on to another topic, uh, neighborhood engagement, which I think would help with the NIMBYism. Uh, your, our, our, our neighborhoods are, there's a lot of active neighborhoods in our community and um, actually getting them involved in this whole process uh, through meeting with them, through uh, finding uh, ways to engage with them and then uh, actually building neighborhoods to be able to organize and to be able to work on uh, neighborhood districts. Um, That's great. And, and they want. So thank Michelle you. Michelle was waving her hand. Those are great. I saw her. Thank you. <laughs> and and uh, the, 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 the diversity of housing as well, the types, but also affordabilities. Um, really great points. Let's go to Omar and then Melanie will follow Omar. Awesome. So I definitely want to uh, second an improved housing market. I think just across the board, we need to improve it, make it way more accessible to so many people. Uh, another thing I want to second, or I don't even know at this point what I'm doing, but uh, uh, you know, a much greener town, you know, more accessible green spaces and ensuring that there's more trees, more plants everywhere. And then one that I haven't really heard of, but I think we all kind of want is just more modern infrastructure, you know, from roads to our amenities you know, internet's not necessarily part of the city that much, but I'm sure we all wish we would have better internet these days. So I think just working on uh, modernizing our infrastructure to ensure that it is reliable and it'll last, you know, the next 10, 15, 20 years. The smart city technology moving in. That's, that's great ideas. Thanks, Omar. Um, Melanie and then Ryan will follow Melanie. Hey everyone. Um, so not to be a broken record, but obviously housing in this city, in this county is a huge issue and to sort of take a different look at it, it needs to obviously consider fire safety. I know that from friends of mine, getting out of Coffee Park was a huge issue because of how dense and narrow the streets are. So that is a piece of that that needs to be considered when planning for this affordable and diverse housing, especially diverse in terms of types as far as apartments and again, higher density, um, we need to make sure that it is obviously safe and that the infrastructure can handle it because chances are we are gonna have to evacuate, you know, so mm -hmm. keeping that in mind. And I just wanna also plus, uh, plus one to Jen's idea of a really vibrant city center and uh, especially make that accessible for youth and to go back to our transportation ideas, you know, keeping later hours available and, and making this a great place for young people and students. And, um, and that's all, that's all my notes. Thank you. Great, thanks Melanie. Great addition. Um, I had Ryan next on the list, but then I lost Ryan's picture. I'm here. Oh, there you are, okay. <laughs> there you are. thanks. Yeah. So I pretty much want to plus one everything, but I guess another lens I kind of want to look at it through that surprised me or I hadn't really thought of is the whole demographic of Santa Rosa's growth being through seniors and, and families without children. Um, I'd like to see a general plan that specifically attracts youth, gets um, our kids to want to stay here, makes it, I think Mike said, you know, make it affordable for them to stay here. A lot of the ideas that have been brought up, like a vibrant city center, attracting industries for, for um, younger folk, those sorts of things I think need to be central just for the kind of longevity of our, of our city. That's great, great points. Um, and, you know, a, a reminder is this is a long-term plan as we're visioning and thinking of this future, you know, smart city technology, like Omar mentioned, and um, the, the kids inheriting all of this from us uh, during the course of this is really key. Um, uh, Ratuja, why don't you go next and we'll follow uh, with Annette. Um, okay, so I think two important things just came up for me. 
Um, one is like, I'd like to see more research on what modes of communication are like most effective for different demographics. Um, I know that uh, especially the first public comment like really hit home for me um, because a lot of seniors, they are in fact like um, technologically disconnected. Um, and so maybe like doing more in-person outreach or canvassing would work for them. And say um, for our minority groups, like lang language access is a huge barrier when it comes to communication and alerts. Um, and yeah, things like that. And um, having a strong communication system is really important also for like when there's a fire during fire season, because so much of it um, relies on that. So um, yeah, another thing that I'd like to see is maybe us focusing on equity and resources in the education um, scene. I know that, uh, or we all know like um, schools located in more in zip codes that have say more low income people are, have historically been like underfunded. Um, and I know actually the school that I currently go to, it doesn't have programs like AVID or Upward Bound. So it's a huge disadvantage for our first gen students who go there. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd like to see things like that as, as well as maybe career counseling or uh, maybe ethnic studies programs in the schools as well. Okay. Just um, allowing the youth to find their power, really. No, no, that's fantastic. No, great. Thank you. Um, Annette, you're next, and then we will go to Erica after Annette. I would like to, my vision is to see that the lower end neighborhoods get raised up a little bit. There seems to be a lot of inequity between certain neighborhoods. I live in South Park, and we have some really wretched potholes and things like that that don't happen in other neighborhoods. So I would like to see the bottom level get raised up a little bit. I would like to see if there is new housing come in that all the low end and high density housing doesn't get put into South Park or Roseland or other places that already have plenty going on that they need to deal with. I would like to see SRPD get more involved with the community. I just read about a program in LA where they were um, basing the uh, police's pay and raises on how well they connected with their community. And they assigned people to a beat that they had to stay on for five years so that they got to know the neighbors there. It would be really good to do something like that because I think it would encourage people to know their police officers and the officers to know their neighborhoods and help the relations that we have going there. And uh -huh. last but not least, I think um, we're desperate for some youth activities. Uh, everything got shut down with COVID and during that time, gang activities in our neighborhood has increased probably 100%. And so without anything for kids to do, they're gonna get in trouble. So I think we really need to be thinking about that and offering them either uh, job training or after school programs, everything that's been cut is stuff that they all need and we don't have it right now. And I think that's causing problems in lower end neighborhoods. All right. Thank and, you. And diversity and equity that, great, thank you, thank you. Um, Erica, why don't you go next, followed by Allie. Yeah, I would echo a lot of what people already said. I love the idea of a vibrant downtown. Um, that sounds really great. Affordable housing. Um, for me, one of my big priorities is biking around town. I live in Northeast Santa Rosa and I bike my kid over to Roseland. He goes to Cesar Chavez. And so we would always bike along the bike trail. Um, and so we, you know, we encountered a lot of the homelessness when the trail got taken over. And so figuring out how to address homelessness in general, one of the comments I got back when I sent out the survey to people was around the first, um, one of the first issues that's listed is creating housing for all. And I think that encompasses homelessness, but being more specific in calling out homeless services, because I think there's affordable housing and then there's also like the mental health issues around homelessness. And so it's like being more intentional about differentiating it too. Like I don't personally know enough about it, but you know, last year biking my, I guess he was then like six or seven years old son to school and explaining like why there are people living on the bike trail. That's a pretty like, like intense conversation to have. Um, but my vision for him is that in a couple of years time, he'll be able to ride his bike to school as well on his own or with friends. Um, cause that's something that I was fortunate to be able to do as a kid. So that's my, that's my vision. Great. We're getting, we're getting a lot of, a lot of detail on housing and the equity and distribution of services and amenities as well. And these are all, these are all core to the general plan, but core, you know, to the, to the vision moving forward. So this is, this is great. Um, 
Ali and then Aaron after uh, Ali. Uh, yeah, so some of the things that I also want to back up are something that Ratuja and Annette said was a lot about youth, um, I think housing, and I think we need to take into consideration just how with COVID, it's impossible to work on and uh, reinforce our youth, but I think that we need to focus on how we're going to keep them busy, give them something to look forward to, uh, goals, because um, a lot of these areas Sometimes they, have, they are single parents and they are alone most of the time, most of the day they have to manage on their own. Transportation can be an issue if they want to go stay at a, at a grandparent's home or at an aunt's house to get taken care of. But I definitely think that we need to focus on um, investing in our youth so that when they become these young adults, they know how to uh, work themselves through the community, uh, can gear them up to getting an education and essentially also saying, you know, having their own part and what they'd like to see in their community. I think um, we definitely need to uh, connect with the elderly as well because they are out of touch. Uh, sometimes they, I have, there's people who haven't seen their uh, family members because of COVID. And so we need to find out a way that we can contact with them and also keep them up to date, make them feel safe and comfortable as well in community and included. Great, great ideas. And the, the connections between all of us and it, it's hard not to be so impacted with COVID um, it's affect all of us to say the least, but as we move out of this and in the future, you know, how we're connected going through, um, these planning and land use and mobility, all these connections, I think is really important. I think, um, you also hit on another really important part of, of this process and future discussions is the economic development strategy and the tools and access to the kids today to be able to get the jobs in town and to grow, you know, within Santa Rosa is, is really key as we eventually start thinking about you know these land uses as well. Um, so with that, I think we were at Aaron next, and then let's go to uh, Trisha after Aaron. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I think I just wanted to start by thinking about what it was like to live in Santa Rosa during and right after the fires. And as crazy and difficult as that was to live through, I also think it made me really recognize the community that we have here and all the reasons why I love Santa Rosa and love this area. When I think about the future and I hear some of the themes people are talking about, I think a vibrant downtown actually has the ability to really address a number of different needs, both with driving economic development. We can look at having affordable housing go downtown and actually make that into a very vibrant urban core. And I think doing that is also gonna probably open up some more mobility options where having more people in certain areas are gonna help us find alternative ways to do transportation with smart train, with bikes, and then with other means. Um, I think other key issues for me, I say sustainability and that to me means focusing on building green infrastructure, but it also means continuing to focus on access to nature and doing that in an equitable way. And then I think I'd also talk about healthy communities, which I think there's a lot of components of that. Obviously, affordable housing is part of it. But I think looking at the briefing book, to me, it's kind of disappointing that Santa Rosa is actually behind the curve compared to other California communities. And it would be great if the general plan was saying, this is a beautiful community. This is a place we want people to live. We should be uh, you know, leading the curve in California on all of these health metrics. Um, so I think that that would be a way of having equity and thinking about healthy communities being mm -hmm. part of our, our long-term vision. Great. Those are great points, Aaron. Thank you. Um, Trisha next, and then uh, Stephanie after Trisha. I think I got all this right, but I'm pacing through all my own, uh, my own cheat sheet here. So Trisha, Trisha next, and then Stephanie. All right, thank you. Um, I have just taken a couple notes throughout, and so piggybacking on a couple of people's comments, Jen mentioned the vibrant city center and I think that would be amazing. I also think that having something similar maybe scaled down for different neighborhoods like if South Park and uh, like I live in like Mountain View area off of Santa Rosa Avenue if we had these like smaller city centers where we have access to public parks and local businesses and things that are a little more tailored to our smaller community within the community that we could also visit throughout the city of Santa Rosa um, so that we could get to know 
the pockets of the city a little bit better. Um, and then what Yvette mentioned on income house based housing, I was living in Northeast Santa Rosa in a community that had mixed income housing, where we were a planned development that had everything from 3000 square foot houses to duplexes and apartments above garages that were all owner occupied and um, or rented out within different pricing, pricing structures. So mm -hmm. the in theory, that community, those children all went to school together at various incomes that school collected income tax for, or yeah, I guess property taxes from various income levels. Um, and as a mother of two very young children, that's important to me. I want my girls to go to school with a varied group of people. And I'd like now living in an area where our school district elementary schools are so underfunded compared to some other areas within Santa Rosa, um, seeing some of that be a little more equitable throughout the city as a whole. Those are kind of mine. And then of course, green and sustainable. I think environmentalism is a really important topic. Great. Oh, thank you, Trisha, that was great. Uh, Stephanie and then Annie, following Stephanie. Everyone, um, so I, I think some of the things that I'm gonna mention have also been talked about. Um, I want to bring up three points, the first being diverse and equitable housing. So I live in Southwest Santa Rosa and there's a lot of development happening here. Um, and it seems, it feels really unequitable compared to um, the developments that we know that are going up in other parts of the city. So when I think about 20 years down the future, I would like to see um, our quadrant of Southwest Santa Rosa not feel so dense and, um, and packed with housing and people when we don't have the infrastructure for it. Um, and that brings me to my second point about resilient and sustainable infrastructure. Um, I think that as we need housing, we definitely need housing. We need more diverse and equitable housing. And we also have to think about our infrastructure when, when we do that. Um, our roads, especially here in Southwest Santa Rosa are not equipped to, for, for the amount of homes that are going up. Um, so I, I would like to see that be a little bit more to be addressed a little bit more equitably as well. Um, Paul, I, and then I kind of wrote down in my notes policies that say like, you can't build here unless you build here. Um, and I know that we have a lot of NIMBYism in, in, in Santa Rosa, but I think there are great agencies that um, that can tackle that on. Um, and then the, the last point, I think it was Aaron who mentioned about uh, data, the data in the briefings, that was also really alarming for me. Um, and so I would like to see a, a city or a community that that really values health equity um, and so that means taking a whole person approach to our policies and to the way that um, the general plan is created and so for me that means access to services access to resources to parks to open space um, and safe places for people together so thinking about the whole person great thanks Stephanie that was really really good um, Annie, let's go next. I think we have a couple more. We're going to get to uh, Andreas and then actually wrap back around with Gary as well because he kind of started but then kind of uh, <laughs> do a few comments there. Now he's left. <laughs> and now he left as a chair, but let's go to Annie and then uh, Andreas. So I think I, all of these issues I feel are really important. Um, one of the issues that's very important to me is city hardening for fires, which kind of goes hand in hand with us having to work with the county on that. Um, the fires are coming from outside to the inside and that ends up, we have fires, we have um, less, less housing for people, mm -hmm. we have more mental illness issues. So also if we deal with the fire issues, we start, that, that takes us right into the whole climate change, which takes us into getting less transportation out there, more people on bikes, more walking. Um, so that kind of goes hand in hand. I would love to see us uh, dive into the mental health um, facilities again, to be able to have that resource. I think that's a huge issue in combating some of the homeless situations. And I would love to see more outreach to seniors. Um, I think this pandemic has shown all of us that many seniors couldn't even get the shot because they didn't know how to navigate the system. Mm. And that's a big deal. That's, that's a huge deal and, and it just requires us to be a little bit more mindful of getting people out there and having people help people, which is really, I think, what we're talking about in all this. 
Yeah, that's great. Thank, thank you, Annie. Um, Andreas, do I have on the list, but don't see in front of me now. No, maybe I. Yeah, I, I may have been a bit late, so I apologize for that. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Sorry, no worries. <laughs> I'm right here. No, yeah, but to piggyback on what Annie said, yeah, there are a lot of elderly here that, you know, don't have kids. And, you know, I'm always constantly thinking about my parents, how I'm planning to take care of them. Not many people have that luxury um, in the near future. So I do believe that's something that we need to be mindful of. Um, but one thing that's been hitting home for me is, um, you know, diversity here in the city. And not just like diversity and, you know, housing and employment, but businesses, you know, I think we need to be um, more supportive of the businesses that we have here and kind of spread them around a bit, you know, like I live here in Southwest Santa Rosa, Spousal Road, um, to be a little bit more exact. And yeah, they, you know, they call it Little Mexico, which is great, you know, I love that. Um, but it doesn't have to be, you know, we can have Hispanic businesses in downtown, we can have them all over the place, you know, it doesn't have to be there. You don't have to concentrate it there. So uh, for the next 20 years or so, yeah, I would like to see uh, more diversified businesses um, all over the county, even, you know? That's great. So. Yeah, thank you. No, it's great to add. I think um, Anna Stevens and Hugh Helm were, are not here, but I wanted to, to wrap back around with Gary because you kind of started, but then we jumped into it. I'll make sure he still have a chance as well, well to add to the vision to side of it. Thank you. And, and thank you all for the, the statements. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to, to hear and it just reminds me one of the best things about this community is people want to be involved uh, circling back though because I have been involved um, as a council member a general plan document is an is just a land use document at its core so some of the aspirational statements that I heard here which I agree with I don't know if they're applicable to this process so staff you can correct me if I'm wrong but to me it, it's basically what are we going to allow for land use. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little bit of all encompassing. And yes, it is around land use decisions, but the general plan touches all different aspects of city services, amenities, staffing levels, priorities as well. Um, I do want to emphasize that, you know, this is the vision for the plan, but it's the vision for the city and the discussions we're going to have over the course of this project are going to touch um, a lot of different aspects. With that, I want to do it just a quick then, wrap up here. If I may just wrap it up yeah. just really quickly, if it's if it touches every area, which I'm fine with, everybody here stay involved politically. It's all about a council majority as to what you want for your vision for your city. And that's the best thing I can offer. And I'll just leave it at that. That that is a good wrap up. We are we are here to bring everyone into the process on the CAC, but also bigger as well. Um, we do need to reserve some time because we do have members of the public to provide comments as well. I do want to show though just real quick where we're going with this. So what Anna's been doing in the background is creating a lot of these ideas and coalescing some of these vision statements as well. And you can see her cursor. She's, she's still doing it right now also. Um, for CAC members though, additional thoughts, additional ideas, additional comments, this is the, the first kind of big discussion on visioning. Uh, send thoughts and ideas to Andy, add them into the, the chat here as well. I think we have one additional question or comment here from Delachey, and then uh, we'll need to you know, do pause here for public comment as well. So uh, Delachey, one last uh, question I think you, you had. No, actually I wasn't able to talk. I brought up- um, Oh, sorry, I thought you had, I apologize. Uh, no. Um, so um, my big concern is, yes, with housing, but having housing for single people um, and even men in particular as well, I, I tend to find out that um, families, people who have children, of course, we're going to give them housing first, but that's kind of just leaving out a whole section of people who, if you don't have a child, then you you literally, what I'm told is you have to wait till someone passes away for you to grab an apartment and be able to get into um, affordable housing. So I'd like to see some more housing for just individuals as much as with families. Mm -hmm. um, I would definitely like to see, um, I'd like to see a community center that 
that would go out um, for all, for all people, all marginalized communities, just one nice community center um, to bring everyone together. I've, I've yet to see that type of thing here. Mm -hmm. and, um, also, um, I think bringing more entertainment to, to Santa Rosa for our youth. Um, maybe we can um, roost up one of these swimming pools and actually make it where there's slides and you know more more adventurous and a nicer I don't know a, a, a somewhere where we can have more concerts or something bring some more entertainment uh, value give something for the youth to do but some for all ages to do um, particularly. Um, I think with the community center would be great. I, I'm, I belong to a lot of organizations and we're always trying to find somewhere to meet up and have meetings and be good that we'd have like a place we could go meet up. Um, so yeah, just bringing more activities. You know, if a lot of people come here for wine tasting and they bring their family, well, what are the kids doing? You know, just some more entertainment, definitely. Yeah. Oh, cut out a little bit there. But yes, those are great points as well. And we're hearing community, 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 community tonight, which is really fantastic. Um, and apologies, LJ, I, I, I had barked you off, but you, um, I'm glad you raised your hand as well. Just to make sure I didn't miss any other CAC members, if I did, please raise your hand. But I think we got everyone who is on here. Looks good, going once, going twice. Okay. Um, one, one quick thing just to show here of, of where, where we are heading before we go to public comment. So next steps, as we mentioned, getting the word out, we'll, we'll send materials to the CAC members, to all of you about the next steps for this workshop, community meetings, ways to engage folks as part of community event set number one. Um, we're, we haven't scheduled an exact day, but once we get through this big engagement set, we'll be meeting back with all of you here in July as sort of tentatively the next CAC meeting, but expect uh, a lot of emails and materials here from us in the near term and support as well from our team and staff. Um, but if there's additional thoughts or ideas, send Andy emails. Um, you know, this was a great, great discussion tonight and it helps us kind of frame some big vision elements that will be again, part of what we take to the community. So with that, I'll wrap up this part of the agenda and actually head back to Andy, because I know we do have to take public comments. I think we have around 10 or 11 members of the public who are also with us here tonight. And, and Dan, actually, maybe if we could do this, if we could ask any members of the public who would like to make a public comment, we'd love to hear it. Um, if you would raise your hand, then um, the other Michelle, called Michelle number one, uh, can count it up and see how many we have. It's 7.45. You know, for a council member, that would be a three-minute uh, public comment. We might need to make it by two minutes each, uh, in order that everybody gets a chance to speak. So, are you seeing any hands raised, Michelle? So far, I am seeing two hands raised. Okay. Well, well then. Three. Oh, well, we had three, and then it went back down to two. Okay. Well, then maybe what we can, we can afford the full three minutes for each of those brave speakers. You don't have to use it, but, um, uh, but you, you may. So Michelle, why don't you lead off with who's there? Okay, great. So we are going to have um, G. Farron um, followed by Cecil. And I don't see a timer, but my name is Gregory. Oh, perfect. I just wanted to make sure that you could unmute. Let me get the timer up for you. Okay, Do you see it now? I see it now. Perfect. Your time begins now. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've got to minimize the screen so I can see my text. Um, can you, let's see, how do I do this? Uh, your timer is now taking over my computer. And so it's hard for me. Ah, oh, here, wait, maybe I can do it this way. If you were to drag the timer out of the way, you know, the top bar. Yeah, no, I'm okay. Um, I'm recording X. 
Damn, this hasn't ever done it before. Okay, my wife just walked in with it, so let me read it to you. Um, first of all, thank you for your service and for your participation and for all that you've contributed right now. Um, while it's not a regular front page newspaper issue, the general plan is an incredibly significant opportunity for our city to chart its path forward together. That's very important to us. While the content of the plan has long lasting implications, the process of making the plan also has an opportunity to impact the culture and patterns of how our government and residents interact with each other here in Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa together, of which I'm speaking for, urges you to reach out in meaningful neighborhood-based engagements to the true heart of this community for their thoughts and ambitions. We know it will be well worth your time and energy to do so. The general plan should be an opportunity to set policy that clearly describes the aspirations that we all share for the future of our city. When we get disconnected from a clear understanding of where we wanna go as a community, the general plan begins to feel more arbitrary and, and the implementation of it feels a lot of bureaucratic work. We would strongly encourage the council to hold this process to a higher standard, one that goes beyond simply fulfilling the implements of getting community input. Rather, use the process to inspire greater civic engagement. One example is the underdeveloped sense of neighborhoods that seems to characterize much of our city. A true sense of neighborhood is usually accompanied by a front yard culture where neighbors live in a common vicinity and interact with each other. Where this culture is present, a community is more likely to get community engagement. Where there's genuine community engagement, there's often initiative, creativity, effective problem solving. Instead, many of the areas in our community are more reflected by a backyard culture. People are more isolated and less engaged. Backyard culture is really only very good at saying no. Hence the acronym NIMBY, not in my backyard. We think one of the ways we can create the front yard culture that we desire for our city and to avoid NIMBYism is for the general plan process to ensure that every neighborhood has a voice in shaping the city of Santa Rosa in an inclusive way. Start with meaningful dialogues in each city council district. Provide for follow-up discussions in any neighborhood that wants to engage. The hard work of implementing your plan will depend on working relationships that live in our neighborhoods. Please utilize your process to build those relationships and that participation. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. Okay, we're going to go to Cecil followed by Jorge. Cecil, can you see the timer? I can. It says 10 seconds. Yes, I'm going to update that for you <laughs> yeah, now. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Oh, are we good to go? Okay. Um, so my name is Cecile, and um, I wrote something in the chat earlier, so I want to apologize. I, I, I'm not good at social media, and it always comes off like very disconnected from what I'm thinking. But I resonated with a lot of what was said. I just um, want to put out there that more um, public transportation, I think we should get rid of the 101 going through the city. So I know we're so used to dividing that way, but I can't imagine why um, it's there, why it can't be sort of on the outskirts. I resonated with, I couldn't track uh, who said what after a while, but I resonated with um, whole person and healthy neighborhoods, um, which means walkability and walkability to services. Even uh, Mr. Bertelbo um, in the very beginning talked about uh, being able to walk to a corner store. So not that we need everything um, that is in de the downtown, but I think um, corner stores, whatever a neighborhood says they want as like community anchors. Um, and I, I think that's it for now. I will send my remarks um, after that, but um, I am super impressed with the group and the diversity of what I heard tonight. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And you know where to send your notes to the, um, it was on the, on the chat. We'll repeat Okay, it. now we're going to Jorge. Jorge, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear me? Great, and can you see the timer on the screen? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, great, your time starts now. Great, uh, so I just have a few comments I'd like to make. The first is, uh, I guess I'd like to echo on the first commenter um, points about having deeper community involvement. I feel that this is very true. Uh, I myself live and grew up in Roseland and there's been lots of developments that sometimes the neighborhood groups oppose and there's really no avenue for them to, you know, uh, to have their voice heard. And then when the development gets passed, a lot of people don't realize that it's because it was approved in the general plan 20 years ago, you know? And so I think even though maybe it's discouraged to get into the details of the general plan and of the land use policy, uh, I think neighbors need to know and residents need to know because uh, these things do eventually come to fruition and if you're wondering why there's now a, a large apartment you know building next to you a lot of times it's because it was approved in general plan years and years ago so i think having a deeper sense of community involvement and not being afraid to go into the details is key um, when generating this plan so i'd like to uh, just point that out i also think uh, that we need to stress how important it is to hold the general plan accountable because in the current general plan we talk a lot about equity we talk a lot about uh, building out the infrastructure, particularly in Southwest and, uh, and Southeast Santa Rosa. Uh, and again, that general plan has been around for quite some time, but yet it hasn't been, uh, I know it's aspirational, but I think we can do more and we can do better to um, prioritize certain areas for development and for infrastructure improvement. I think that needs to be called out specifically uh, in the general plan. And finally, on one aspirational note, I think a very important thing is for Santa Rosa to find kind of its soul, you know, like what makes Santa Rosa Santa Rosa. I think it's the trees. Um, I think it's how beautiful the natural area is. And I think we need to highlight that and we need to uh, keep that as a center of the city focus so that when people think about Santa Rosa, when outsiders think, hey, what's Santa Rosa? They think uh, it's a city of trees, it's a city of roses, whatever we, we want. But I think that decision also needs to be made or at least thought about um, because I think that's ultimately what attracts people, what makes things interesting. And one final thing, I do think we need to have funner uh, activities for our youth. You know, I know a lot of friends who are moving out of the area because they think it's boring. Uh, I don't think it's boring, but I know a lot of people do think it's boring and there's kind of a lack of entertainment um, and activities for our younger people. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you. And our kids, thank you. <laughs> okay, and it, I'm not seeing any other hands for public comment at this time. Great, well, thanks everyone. Um, just sort of a quick wrap up and we're actually about four minutes uh, left here, which is good. So we got through all this on time. A wealth of ideas and comments tonight. So really, really appreciate it. Um, to the community and also the CAC as more ideas come to us this weekend or next week, uh, please feel free to send those through email or through the comment form on the website. Uh, in chat, Andy at the city put in the uh, email and also the website address there as well. I did wanna mention uh, additional question by Steve on the CAC and that was related to materials and items we can provide CAC members to further reach out to the community. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, but I'll provide a little more detail, we are preparing uh, engagement toolkits essentially. And it'll be a collection of digital materials, but also physical materials. So we have options on how we get out to folks and collect more ideas and information throughout this process. So we're developing those right now, but we want to get a series of tools and materials out to CAC members to, again, reach all the neighborhoods, reach the community, and really get as much input as we can. This is something we're going to continue throughout the process, not just during COVID time, um, but it is a challenge with stay-at-home requirements and social distancing of how we're doing engagement early on. So just want to let everyone know uh, that information is, is forthcoming. 
Um, I think we have one more question or maybe comment from Yvette before we close. So I want to call on you and um, we'll, we'll close here uh, shortly. Um, I believe this is going to be a question for Andy. I know the city is repurposing and rezoning some of the properties here locally. So how would that affect what we're trying to do as we're moving forward and we're making a plan this for 25 years? If the city is making some changes in that capacity, how would that affect our work and how would that affect our work? It's a good um, question. I can, I'll let Andy start, but I'll jump yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. So your question really is an opportunity for us to make the, the statement about the power of the general plan. We do, the general plan is big ideas and, and we're talking about aspirations, but it also lays down the map of land use classifications. It says in these areas are appropriate land use as apartments, you know, retail centers, um, uh, uh, job centers in the city. Zoning is the tool that makes those land uses happen. And, and while the general plan is being updated as we're doing now, there's certain business that has to happen within the city. And there are, there are rezonings that, that can occur, but we're coming to a point close soon in, in our process where we may need to, to think about specific strategic spots where it's not in the public interest, in the community interest to implement a zoning. And it will be the city's council's determination uh, whether uh, rezoning can happen. And as we get closer with our general plan, it may not be consistent with the general plan goals and objectives. So we may have rezonings, you'll see those, those are ordinary business. Um, they are rezoned consistent with the general plan land use categories. And there may be legitimate public discussion whether certain rezoning should be performed or, or taken place because of contemplative change in this new general plan. That was perfect, actually. <laughs> that was well said, Andy, is intentionally the general plan update is a long process from a time standpoint. You know, we want to address all the issues, discuss multiple rounds with the community as things change, but there's still uh, the business of the city that takes place during this. And so there's, there's a balance there, especially um, you know, doing a general plan update once every 15 to 20 years. And if the vision changes, how's that balance? Um, that's really something we'll work you know, collectively with staff and, and city councils, we go, go through this process. Um, with that, we are right at the eight o'clock hour. So again, I just wanna thank everyone uh, this evening, great discussion. I wanna thank uh, Anna for doing fantastic recording in the digital background of all of this as well and getting comments. Um, again, for all of us and the community, this video will be posted on the website. We'll be getting materials out here shortly as we get closer to really launching the community engagement process. So thank you again to all the CAC members and the community members participating tonight. Great discussion, we really appreciate it. And we'll keep the discussion going. Uh, we'll have a meeting you know, here pretty soon, but we wanna get all of you all actively involved as well in this first round of uh, community engagement around visioning. So again, thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Everyone.